in the first chapter of this great spiritual book of John, he pictures for us the headquarters of that mighty river, the Church of Christ. He gives an account of the calling of the first disciples. As soon as I use the word church, many people flinch and with good reason. The Christian church has made many, many mistakes. Where are its protests against war? The stupidest, wickedest activity of human beings. War. Where are the church's protests? Slavery for millennia. Church was slow until William Wilberforce, John Newton, great Christians came along and they stirred the world's conscience about slavery. But the church was slow. Of course, the reason people flinch about the church was the same reason Gandhi gave, Mahatma Gandhi. Why aren't you a Christian, Gandhi? Answer, Christians. The people in the Christian church are not angels, they're human beings. And the church, like every other institution, has its dangers. Now, none of us are so stupid to think that every politician is a saint, but we spend a good deal of time talking about politics. And then there's business. We've all been cheated by some businessmen. Do we give up business? No more than we give up politics. Or well, why do we give up the church? Well, the answer is simple, because we're stupid. I need to tell you that as far as the Bible is concerned, there are only two churches, not Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. The only two churches recognised by God are the invisible church, the real church, the church of the twice born, and the visible church, which according to Christ would be like a net that gathered fish both bad and good. According to Christ, the visible church would be like a field with not only wheat but weeds, tares. But a few things I should say on the side of the church. During the Middle Ages, the church preserved education in Ireland, England and Europe quiet men used their quills to record what was known for sure. Education was preserved by the church. The church has been responsible for thousands of dispensaries for the poor and the sick. It's very rare that an atheist found a dispensary for the penniless. I should also remind you that many of the greatest scientists have been Christians. Go and read the history books. So many wonderful people of history or followers of Jesus Christ. I think of Luther and Calvin and John Knox and the Wesley brothers. You remember Charles Wesley wrote thousands of hymns and those hymns set us singing with joy in our hearts. I remember at one of the three universities where I spent a lot of time, I was a bit just depressed with all the work I had to do. But I went and bought a, a recorder for records and a record 
that I first played was Wesley's and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who him pursued, for me who put him to death and immediately my feelings change. Oh yes, there have been many wonderful Christians and the excuses we make for flinching when we hear the word church are not altogether valid. If they were, we'd give up politics and we'd give up business, etc, etc, etc. Now let's look at the account of the headwaters of that mighty river, the Christian church, the calling of the first disciples. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 1. And I shall begin at verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. I have seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning round and probably with a smile, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about the tenth hour, that's four o'clock in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, you will be called Cephas, that's an Aramaic word for rock. In the familiar tongue, Peter. The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, finding Philip. Very interesting. In the Greek language, seek and find keep recurring in this passage. But in most modern translations, they use other words. But here in the NIV, it constantly talks about finding, finding, finding Philip. He said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael, told him we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked, come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. Now you remember the name Israel was given to Jacob who had been a cheat and a twister. But when he wrestled with God he was converted and was given the name Israel. So when God through Jesus says to Nathaniel, an Israelite indeed is saying this man has no Jacob in him. He's a genuine Israelite. Then Nathaniel declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. Not under a tree, under a fig tree. Very specific. You'll see greater things than these. He then added, I tell you the truth, 
you'll see heaven opened an angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Of course, that's a quotation from Genesis 28. When guilty Jacob had ran and walked swiftly 40 miles <coughs> away from his murderous brother Esau, having cheated Esau, he found a stone for a pillow and lay down to sleep. And he saw this great ladder, a golden ladder, linking heaven and earth, and angels going up and down. And Jesus quotes it. What is he saying? He's saying, Nathaniel, now you're my disciple. The heavens will open to you. You will be subject to the ministry of angels. Angels will go with you wherever you go. The heavens being open have many fulfillments. There's been a fulfillment at the baptism. The heavens opened and God spoke. The main fulfillment will be at the cross. There, Christ breathed his last and the way was opened after resurrection to ascend into the open heavens. But the prophecy has several fulfillments. And in effect it is saying that if you're a Christian, you have a franchise of heaven. If you are a Christian, you are already viewed by God as seated in heavenly places. Marvellous. So I say to you who watch today, are you risen and reigning with Christ? Are you a citizen of heaven? today. Amazing that a church that now consists of two billion members should have begun with six. But you know, two snowflakes on top of a mountain, they begin to roll down to the valley. They will create around them an avalanche by the time they reach the valley. You'll notice in this story that as soon as Andrew finds Christ, he starts looking for his brother. My friend, if you're a Christian, you long to see other people converted. The sure sign of conversion is that the conversion person is like Andrew, looks for his brother, his sister, his friend, his neighbour, to win others to Jesus Christ. You become a soul winner by the life you live and perhaps the words you say when you become a Christian. God grant you and I may see the wisdom of agreeing with the one who has loved us enough to die for us. God bless you.